Hello, hello everybody. Santiago Brand here again, and I'm very happy to be uh, presenting another webinar to you. This one I'm particularly excited about. We're going to talk about an introduction to neuroinflammation today. And I think this is an uh, important and relevant topic for all those who work in uh, physical health, medical health, mental health. And those of you particularly interested in biofeedback and neurofeedback, because it's a topic that directly relates to your interventions uh, with these modalities. And for today, we have some course objectives, which is describe glia cells and how they can contribute to inflammation, list uh, factors that contribute to brain inflammation, identify symptoms that are associated with different levels of neuroinflammation, how neuroinflammation changes brain activity, and how it influences the EEG, and couple of things we can look for in the QEG, EEG, uh, to determine whether there's neuroinflammation present in a, in a client, and a list of interventions for neuroinflammation as well. And with that in mind, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I always like to provide people with some literature where they can start reading more on the topic and inform themselves better. And these are three books that I consider essential reading, but also important introductory reading um, to the topic of neuroinflammation. On the very left of your screens, you will see a book called Brain Inflamed. And this is a book that specifically talks about inflammation in children. So it's for people who are working with doing pediatric neurofeedback, pediatric biofeedback, people whose population is mainly uh, children and teenagers can read this book and learn about different sources of neuroinflammation and how it can affect brain activity and brain health. In the middle is the famous book by uh, Donna Jackson called The Angel and the Assassin and is a book about glia cells. Uh, Donna Jackson is a, a science journalist and she's written other excellent books before. But this book talks about current research in uh, and current findings in neuroglia and inflammation and is written for the general public in mind. Now, if you want to get more advanced, then you go to the right and you can read the blood brain barrier and inflammation. This is more of a scientific book with more technical and scientific language in it. But if you're science oriented, uh, then it's a good book to read. It's, it's a dense reading. It takes several sweeps over it to understand, but it's quite interesting for you. Now, let's talk about glia cells, which is the foundation of, of, uh, of the neuroinflammation response. And we will have mainly three types of glia cells in our brain. The first one is called the astroglia, and they're more commonly known as the astrocytes. And they're in charge of maintaining the blood brain barrier in a proper chemical environment. So the layer that surrounds the brain that protects the brain, the blood brain barrier is mostly astrocytes. Then we have the microglia and the microglia's main purpose is to eat dead tissue and dead cells. So they're the scavengers and they patrol the brain. They move around the brain eating dead tissue and eating unhealthy, dangerous cells. Um, and then we have the oligodendrocytes, which make the myelin sheath, which is the fatty layer that protects the axon of the neuron. And that fatty layer ensures that connectivity between neurons is optimal, is healthy. And in conditions like MS, multiple sclerosis, you start losing the myelin sheath, and that's when you start losing connectivity and you start experiencing other kinds of symptoms. These three types of glia are essential for brain health and uh, for mental health down the road. And it's important to understand this because 90%, 90% of your brain is composed of glia cells, divided in microglia, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. Now, 10 to 15% of that 90% population of glia cells are astrocytes. And once you lose them, you don't get them back. So the type of cell that once it's dead, doesn't return back to life is the glia cells. And because your brain is 90% glia cells, it's very, very important to protect them. So as a human being, you 
it's in your best interest to do anything and everything you can to protect your glia cells. And as a clinician, as a practitioner, it's very important that you get the message across to the client that they need to protect the brain health. And protecting the glia cells is everything. It's essential for better health down the road. Now, it only takes losing 10 to 11% of the glia population to guarantee that you will have blood-brain barrier permeability. That means that things that are not supposed to get into your brain will start getting in your brain. And this is now where the research points to the foundation of things like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, and other type of neurodegenerative conditions in the central nervous system. So if you're not protecting your glial cells, you're making your, your brain permeable, more leaky, things that are not supposed to get there will get there, and then you start getting into trouble. Now, the other essential element here to understand is that there's a window of time. So you cannot forever neglect brain health and then try to take care of it. Once you have passed the essential window of time, there's nothing that you can really do to reverse and course correct. And it, it just becomes a, a palliative solution. So you have to really understand this more and more, more closely. Now, when we talk about neurodegeneration, things like Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, aphasias, Alzheimer's disease, we're talking about something called protein aggregation disorders. And that means that once your glia cells stop protecting you and they turn against you, your body will start secreting certain proteins that will go through the blood-brain barrier and will start attaching to receptors and layers of your brain. This is normally known as plagiarism. So what that's that play starts adding to your brain, it will start secreting more chemicals that will attack the brain. That's sort of the foundation for autoimmune conditions and the first step in neurodegeneration. And that's the sort of the most basic component of uh, Alzheimer's and other uh, and other conditions. And so if you're not protecting, you're doing protein aggregation. Okay. Now, because the microglia is that tissue, it, it only happens if the brain is healthy. Once the glia turn against you, the glia will not only eat the bad stuff, they will mostly eat good stuff. They will eat good cells and healthy tissue. And that means your own immune cells in the brain, your own protective cells have gone rogue and they will turn against you. And that's when you start experiencing the symptoms. So if they're not primed, um, they won't work. And that means they have to be in a specific healthy state for, for, for them to work for you and not against you. Okay. And once there's priming of the glia cells, once they, they are activated, and they try to guess you, they will shift the shape and they will start doing things that they're not supposed to do in the first place. And to understand this, this, this graph can really help us out. Uh, here you can see on the left, uh, a healthy glia cell. You can see it has a lot of ramifications, a healthy nucleus with healthy mitochondria. And it relates to all of these initial spheres, which are called cytokines. Cytokines are chemicals that this cells produce that can either protect your brain, but they can also damage your brain. Once you get uh, a glia cell prime or activated, it will shift shape. It will switch its, its shape and it will turn into two types of glia. An M1 glia, which is pro-inflammatory, and this is the type of glia that is bad for you. And then we'll have an M2 anti-inflammatory glia. The healthy glia is called an M0 or a steady glia. So you have a steady M0 glia, that's good. And, but once you start feeling or becoming unhealthy for a diverse number of reasons, then we have the M1 and the M2. Now, once you get into the stage where you have M1 and M2 glia, the next step is to make everything possible to get the M1 glia to convert into an M2 glia cell. So at this stage, you cannot get the M1 glia to go back to M0 or the M2 to go back to M0, but the M1 glia, which is the bad one, you can turn it into an M2 
anti-inflammatory good glioso. That's essential. Once we detect neuroinflammation, we have to increase the number of M2 glial cells and decrease the number of M1 glial cells. That's very, very important. And you can see that the M1 glial cells are associated with certain cytokines like interleukin-6, interleukin-12, tumor necrosis factor. There's a bunch of cytokines, uh, which are chemicals that are bad for you. All of this will create neuroinflammation. All of this will be in charge of essentially destroying your brain little by little. And on the other hand, the anti-inflammatory cytokines are in charge of protecting. So there's a balance there, just like anything else in life. Now, neuroinflammation through glia priming can start early in life. So normally you, you will have a healthy brain for the most part. Let's say you're lucky when you're born, there's no complications during birth. Uh, you're a healthy baby, you're a healthy person for the first years of your life. Uh, but at some point in life, you may get uh, an event that triggers this microglia priming, that triggers this cascade of events that end up um, in your inflammation for a lot of people. Now, this is healthy glia branching, uh, connectivity with axons and dendrites and healthy sprouting of the cells. You get a first hit. The most common event that creates glia inflammation, glia priming, is a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, whether or not you have a concussion. If you have a concussion, it, all, it obviously makes things worse, but you don't need to have a concussion or severely hit your head to get glia priming. So if as a child you fall off your bike, you're not wearing a helmet, you hit the pavement, that's the first hit. And now you can see the glia go from a healthy shape to the M1, M2 division, and you can get a second hit. A second hit means you can get either a second TBI, second, second traumatic brain injury, or even a third one. You can um, have stress in your life. You can have a stressful childhood, live in a toxic environment. Uh, you could have trauma, psychological, emotional trauma experience. You can have poor sleep. Your nutrition is not the best. You get... Uh, another sort of bacterial or viral infection. All of those things will trigger a second hit, which in turn exacerbates your inflammation response. And then from there, you will have the, uh, the cytokine release, and then you have your altered synaptic pruning. That means your connections are not healthy anymore. The communication between cells in your brain is not effective. And that's when you start experiencing symptoms of mental illness, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorders, psychosis, um, in some cases, seizure disorders, and the worst case scenarios, anything that's neurodegenerative, such as the dementias or, or Parkinson's disease. So you cannot protect all the time, be protected all the time from life. But what you do is you can set plans in motion that <clears throat> can protect you as, as much as possible once you get glia priming going on because you got a TBI, you were into a car accident, you were dropped as a baby, things you cannot normally control. Now, other elements that play into brain inflammation are prenatal trauma. So your mommy is pregnant with you and she's, she's smoking, she's doing drugs, she's, she's very stressed, she's in a toxic, violent relationship where your dad is beating her up. All of those things will create a cytokine response in your mom, and those cytokines will influence you as a baby. So anything that happens in the environment when you're in the womb, where you have not even been born, can traumatize you. And sometimes clients come to see me, and we find that there's a trauma response. There's trauma neuromarkers in the brain, but they don't remember. And it is because their traumas could have been prenatal or preverbal. We also have developmental trauma. So you're born and then you're born into this unhealthy, um, unwanted environment. You grow up with toxic parents, abusive parents. You grow up in a violent neighborhood. You are neglected. You were not fed. You were not breastfed. You were not uh, told caring words. You were given up for adoption very early. Your parents were put in prison because they were, uh, they were committing crimes. All of those things will create the necessary environment for inflammation to be more likely for you. PTSD, 
trauma and PTSD are very common triggers for neuroinflammation and very common elements that exacerbate neuroinflammation. And therefore, addressing trauma and PTSD in your clients is very important if you want to reverse and control for that neuroinflammation response. Common stress, everyday stress, it doesn't have to be chronic, it only needs to be mild, will contribute to your neuroinflammatory responses. As I explained before, a TBI or a traumatic brain injury will influence that. And there are things that we can do to counteract the effects of all these elements. Exercise is a very important one. There's plenty of research out there, tons of papers that support the, um, the need for exercise and support that the fact that exercise is a good um, technique, a good tool to use when you have neuroinflammation. Nutrition is another one. There's mounting evidence, more and more mounting evidence uh, in the relationship between nutrition and inflammation, nutrition, and mental health. Sleep is very important. Probably the one behavior that we neglect most nowadays. If you don't get enough sleep, you get more neuroinflammation. And you're putting yourself at greater and greater and greater risk. Anything related to your environment, your family, your home, your school, your friends, your neighborhood, your country, your city. All of those things influence neuroinflammation. And there are sometimes there are realities in life in which people cannot escape the environment and, and this kind of direct connection with the people around them. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it's very, very important that, um, that we do the best to control for the neuroinflammation. And all of that uh, is summarized into your lifestyle. The way you eat, the way you take care of yourself makes or breaks your brain health. Now, we also study the, the, the gut-brain axis, of course, and the gut-brain axis is also something that is growing in evidence, and that's the connection between your intestinal tract and your brain. Whatever happens in the gut, whatever happens in your intestinal tract will have an influence on your brain, whether it's positive or negative. And I talk about the gut-brain axis a lot in my work because I am more and more interested in exploring the effects of nutrition into mental health. How what you eat influences your current state and how it can help you become healthier mentally and physically or how it can make you more sick physically or mentally. Now, the, the, the intestinal tract, the gut is very important that's because that's where we manufacture a lot of the T-Rex cells. And these are part of the antibodies that combat things like COVID-19. They're in charge of tracking the body um, and preventing the formation of cancerous cells. They protect you for, from the common cold. They fight uh, infections like HIV. In general, they help you stay healthier. And if you don't have a healthy intestinal tract, you have a very weak immune system, which in turn is going to put your brain at greater risk. And there's more and more evidence, again, in that what you eat, what you eat influences your, your immune response. What the research shows is that the American diet is the worst of them all, is the one that is mostly associated to neuroinflammation, but also conditions like um, cancer and uh, gout and autoimmune disorders. So a, a heavy duty, hard, junk food diet is really not good for you. And the research shows that the keto diet, the ketogenic diet is the best option. Now, when it comes to the ketogenic diet, there's different levels, different layers or different styles of ketogenic diet. And what you should do as an individual is go get tested to see if the ketogenic diet is, is right for you, but also what type of ketogenic diet is right for your metabolism. So it's not to say, I'm not trying to say that everybody should go on a ketogenic diet because that's not the case. And even if you need one, you might need to be able to be tweaked to your specific needs. What protects the microbiome, what ensures a healthy, diverse population of bacteria in your gut is eating your greens. The greener your veggies, the better. So if you have lettuce, kale, spinach, and you have a good healthy salad with olive oil, with uh, healthy fats like avocado, and you eat that before anything else, that helps protect your gut bacteria, your microbiome, and it makes your brain a lot healthier. 
So I'm, I'm not trying to give you a nutritional um, suggestions here. It's just what some of the research uh, out there shows. Now, let's talk about symptoms because your clients will come and they will complain about different things. Some of the symptoms of subtle neuroinflammation. Subtle neuroinflammation means it's the cascade is just getting started. We have time to reverse. We have time to um, optimize things, eliminate symptoms, eliminate conditions. So this is this is to say the earliest, the better. Uh, your clients will report brain fog. They will be forgetful. They will have hazy thoughts. They will have problems recalling things, but it's not too dire. The situation is not that critical yet. Noticeable variations in mental speed. That means sometimes I can focus, sometimes I cannot. Sometimes I have more energy, sometimes I do not. So those those things are important essence. Reduce brain endurance. People feel more tired. Their, their stamina is not the same. They can barely cope. Um, they can barely have energy to go through the day. They end up relying on coffee or other stimulants. Um, there's brain fatigue after exposure to a specific chemical, scents, or pollutants. Just your significant other's perfume or cologne can trigger um, one of these symptoms. And that's a sign that you may have neuroinflammation present. So also feeling fatigued after eating certain things. At this point, it means that you either are developing a food intolerance or food allergies. The first step is food intolerance. And it means you eat something, you get bloated, you get, get drowsy, you get groggy, you get really tired, your sleep is really poor. That's a sign of subtle neuroinflammation. And it's time to look at, into that more closely. Then we go into moderate neuroinflammation. This is where most clients will come to see. The reality is that most people will come to your practice because they're either experiencing moderate neuroinflammation or severe neuroinflammation. People tend to ignore the symptoms when they're first starting because they tend to blame them on, on something else. I'm just not sleeping well. I'm just stressed out. I'm just tired. If I sleep better, if I go on a vacation, it's going to go away. Most of the time, it doesn't. And we will we'll have clients that come complaining with depression, the inability to concentrate for longer and longer periods. Uh, they feel sleepy throughout the day. They, they feel drowsy throughout the day. There's an increased demand for sleep. They, they sleep eight or more hours. But the problem is that they're not getting the rest. That they, need. They, they sleep for eight or more hours and they still wake up tired. They feel lethargic. They feel fatigued. They're, they lose motivation. Very common sign of neuroinflammation is its lack of motivation. They don't want to work anymore. They don't want to get out of bed anymore. They don't want to do things. There's a loss of appetite. They don't eat as much, so the appetite gets suppressed. And obviously, the inability to be physically active is more present. So again, this is not a dire situation, but it's it should be worrisome to some degree, and it warrants a close medical inspection, um, getting tested for such things. And when we have severe neuroinflammation, we have an encephalopathy, and we can detect that in the QEG brain mapping. Here's where your clients will start showing signs of dementia, the first symptoms of early stage dementia. Some will have seizure disorders. Some will have difficulty speaking. They will have tremors, twitching. Uh, they will have delirium, confusion, disorientation. Some of them will start showing psychotic symptoms. And this is the time the essential window is is passed. Uh, this is where normally or, or many times you cannot do anything for them. It's very hard to, to reverse the process. Not for all of these conditions, but for a large percentage of them. So... The earlier you detect something, the earlier you intervene, obviously, the better. You give the brain and the body uh, a better chance at fighting their inflammation, reversing and eliminating it, if possible. Other signs of clinical severity of neuroinflammation is that it's transient. It means it comes and goes. The patient or the client feels good for some time, and then they feel bad. So they sort of roller coaster up and down, feeling good not feeling well, uh, and most of the time they don't feel well. 
they don't feel well most of the time, so they have a couple or a few days of feeling well, but that's short-lived. They have a great day every now and then when the neuroinflammation is more persistent, when it's more chronic. So they have a good day every few weeks, but most of the time they just feel awful. And they have a good day, they feel helpful, and then the day they have a streak of just feeling bad for several days, or weeks, or even months at a time. Significant loss of function is another sign, which means we start seeing symptoms of something more severe, psychosis, um, dementia, and uh, loss of function. And when you have neurological autoimmunity, you know, you have a severe uh, chronic case of neuroinflammation. Anything that's neuro, uh, sorry, autoimmune based, Hashimoto's, um, eczema, uh, dermatotic, uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, hypoglycemia, diabetes, anything that's autoimmune points to severe chronic neuroinflammation. And the treatment here is mostly controlling as opposed to trying to treat. As part of my work, I like to do uh, multidisciplinary interventions and testing. And this is the test of a client that I had a, a few years ago. Wasn't feeling well. Her her EEG showed that she was uh, exhibiting some cognitive decline. She was young at the time, at least young enough not to show, not to be concerned with any dementia. So one of the things that I suggested that she get tested for was heavy metals and here we can see that arsenic is at the top. Uh, so she was indeed experiencing heavy metal foisoning. And, and then she, uh, she started going treatment, undergoing treatment. For that. So she started doing some chelations, some uh, blood uh, transfusions for that as well. And we ended up doing neurofeedback and, and other forms of intervention. And that just goes to show how the interventions should be combined because no matter how much neurofeedback I had done, if we didn't find this out, um, things wouldn't have progressed as efficiently as we would have hoped. And we also did some um, food uh, allergy testing. Functional medicine testing is very thorough and it helps understand the symptomatology because one of the things that functional medicine testing looks for is the root cause of the problem. This is not about targeting symptoms. This is about looking for the root cause, targeting the root cause, and hopefully eliminating the condition altogether. And what we found out is that for this person had a, a huge intolerance to oat and also to eggs. And this is something she was eating essentially every day. She was eating oat for breakfast or eggs with breakfast, sometimes oat and eggs. The two things she enjoyed the most were creating a huge inflammatory cascade for her. Now, does this mean that she can never eat these things again? Not necessarily. In some cases, you have to stop eating them for good and you adapt. In most cases, it's about controlling the inflammation first, reversing the inflammation optimizing your metabolism, optimizing your your gut uh, bacteria, and then you can go back to eating what you enjoyed before. Unfortunately, again, for some individuals, that's not the case. And then we had some elevated intolerances to wheat, um, to gluten, and other ingredients in the food. So for this person, very important to do nutritional restructuration. They need to change their diet around to one that's more favorable for them. Is that something that's easy to do? It's not. Is that something that is pleasant to do? For the most part, it isn't. Does it need to be done? Yes, it does. Now, in the medical field, uh, what we call mental illness is called sickness behavior syndrome. It's, it's a term that's used interchangeably. As mental health practitioners, we'll call it mental illness medical professionals, especially the functional medicine, medicine practitioner, will call it uh, sickness behavior syndrome. But sickness behavior syndrome, a client coming with depression, a client coming with anxiety, bipolar disorder, anger issues, anything that's mental health, behavioral health related, it's going to point to glia priming, which is going to point to neuroinflammation. And therefore, the neuroinflammation intervention needs to be 
heart of your of your intervention techniques psychotherapy biofeedback and neurofeedback emdr brain spotting and neuroinflammations uh, intervention through supplementation through changes and adjustments in into your nutrition is very very important and it gets it it strengthens the notion that more ta- multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary in- interventions are the way to go. So, again, the microbiome become primed, and when we miss that essential window of time, then we have autoimmune activation. And again, you see things like Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, anything that has to do with your thyroid hypothyroidism, um, pre-diabetes, diabetes type one, type two. So. Once we get to the point, the clinical prognosis and the clinical expectations are going to change dramatically. Many times you will end up saying to your client, all the work that we do is going to be maintenance. I'm not too sure that we're going to be able to reverse or eliminate at this point. Therefore, educating the public into not waiting until it's late is very, very important. Now, Neuroinflammation can show in different ways in the EEG, but with the tools that we use, EEG, QEEG, we can help detect it early and we can show objective evidence to somebody that this can be taken care of. So neuroinflammation could hinder nesting and coupling, which are two essential processes in the brain uh, in the way that the different networks of the brain communicate to process information. So nesting and coupling are needed to process information efficiently, to speak, to think, to remember, to react, to learn, to sleep, to self-regulate. Anything and everything we do as human beings in our behavior, our cognition, our emotions, it's related to nesting and coupling. And neuroinflammation will hinder this process, which renders us less efficient and um, less able to navigate life more efficiently. And normally when we do testing, we can do testing like ERPs to see how the brain is doing in terms of nesting and coupling. And essentially these graphs mean the the more red and yellow you have, the better. So we have a neurotypical individual and they're performing well because they have the essential brain waves, which are gamma and beta. We have an ADHD individual who's high performance and they and they have less beta and gamma brain waves, which means less nesting and coupling. And then we have an ADHD low performance individual with almost zero beta and gamma frequencies, which means an almost inexistent uh, nesting and coupling process. This individual is working well and is healthy for the most part. This individual is getting by and this one is struggling. So for these two individuals, we need to see the degree of neuroinflammation that they have and how much it is impacting their brain. And and we can measure this with with the technology that we have, and then we can um, refer the individual to the proper professional. This is an EEG of an individual who is 46 years of age. He's overweight. He has trauma history and is currently experiencing uh, chronic stress. It has a very stressful life. And you can see, uh, for instance, here and here we have some beta spindles. And beta spindles are, among other things, common in neuroinflammation. So because he's overweight, being overweight exacerbates, increases your neuroinflammation. He has trauma PTSD history, which exacerbates neuroinflammation. And he has chronic stress, which exacerbates neuroinflammation. So you have three elements, four elements, and you can see that, see that in the EEG. The next step is to get some metabolic testing to see what kind of neuroinflammatory pattern they have. Because neuroinflammation at the metabolic level, it's different for everyone. It's, it's almost unique to every individual. Um, essentially something similar to what EEG patterns look like. This is a, a, a male, uh, an 11 year old boy and you can see that he has a different pattern from the 46-year-old. This EEG is mostly dominated by high amplitude, slow frequencies. So mostly dominated by theta, delta, and slow alpha frequencies. And this is uh, an ADHD case. Well, he has an authoritarian father. 
obviously a toxic environment. And he has an addiction to sugar, starchy foods, sodas, ice cream. So anything that's starchy, sugary, he loves. And guess what? That's a prime element in neuroinflammation. He's not eating any greens, getting very little protein. His diet is based on how much ice cream I can drink at what, at, get at one time, how much Coke I can get and eat with popcorn when I go to the movies, how much pizza I can have with my friends when they get invited to birthday parties. That's all conducive to that. So we see at an EEG that shows a pattern for ADHD, but we have elements that are contributing to neuroinflammation. This is a female, um, 60 years of age, who came to see me because of anxiety, depression, and trauma. She was bullied at school. Um, she had sent some nude pictures of herself to a boyfriend. They had a, they broke up with the boyfriend, and the boyfriend sent the nude pictures to everyone at school. So it was some of the revenge porn type deal. Um, in addition to that, she has a sleep disorder. We can see here at CZ, the vertex, the infamous vertex wave with sleep stage two sleep activity surrounding it. It's a clear neuromarker for sleep disorder. It could be a sleep apnea, it could be narcolepsy, it could be a parasomnia, but we certainly have a sleep disorder. So the fact that she's anxious, she's depressed, she has a history of trauma and bullying, and she has a sleep disorder, all contributes to neuroinflammation. We target top down with the neurofeedback, bottom up with supplements, with nutrition, with metabolic testing and metabolic interventions. So this young lady can use all the help she can get from psychotherapy, from neurofeedback, but more essentially or more specifically by looking at her metabolic pattern. Now, up to a few years ago, the only way to detect neuroinflammation was either post-mortem um, such in the case of uh, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is very common in football players. Uh, but now, this is a study from May 27 of last year, so it's very, very recent, in which now they're using MRI to show brain inflammation in vivo for the first time. This is very exciting because it means that in a few months or years' time, we're going to be able to do MRIs and brain scans to detect neuroinflammation in vivo. Here's the, here's the name of the paper and the name of the research article that uh, which you can read and uh, on your own. But it's very exciting news because now we can also detect it at the brain level. Structurally with an MRI, functionally with a QEG, metabolically with blood work. We have three ways of assessing neuroinflammation now. And now with the brain scans, we can see the degree of severity that this has in terms of structural impact in the brain. With the QEG, we have we can see the degree of severity that it has in terms of function, brain function. And this is very, very exciting news. Now, we know that in neuroinflammation exists, of course. The next question is, well, how do we prevent it, reduce it, or eliminate it? And again, it's always a combination of things. We can do a QEG or an MRI, we need to do a psychophysiological stress profile. We need to see how much impact stress is having in that person's life. We do neurocognitive testing because we need to see the, the impact in cognitive performance. Functional medicine, they do the, a test called the NLPR3, among other things, to look for specific neuroinflammatory markers. Functional nutrition, specifically design nutritional guidelines for your specific case and other interventions, exercise, meditation, detox, retreats. A combination of all of this ends up being better than either of them individually. And that's how I recommend people approach. Obviously, my expertise and my experience are in QEG, neurofeedback, biofeedback, some in psychotherapy and brain spotting. And when I consult with people, that's how I suggest they operate and, and help their clients. Now, other interventions include biofeedback, such as high rate variability biofeedback, temperature biofeedback, Galvan skin conductance biofeedback. Light therapy, such as photobiomodulation. I use this device called the iSync Wave from a company called iMessync in Korea. This is a portable dry electrode brain scan, but also 
uh, provides uh, red light therapy, neuromodulation. This is a professional boxer that I worked with for some time. And, uh, you know, he was concerned about brain health. Of course, his head is being hit when he's fighting. So we started implementing uh, portable brain scans and red light therapy to help keep his brain healthy and, and prevent neurodegeneration down the road. You can also use other forms of neuromodulation techniques like audiovisual entrainment, cranio, cranio electro simulation, physical exercise is the best form of medicine out there. If you're not exercising, you're really neglecting your health. Um, and exercise can be free. You don't have to en enroll in a gym or hire a personal trainer. You can exercise with some specific guidelines. And of course, nutrition showing more and more research supporting the, how essential it is. Now, this is just um, some of the benefits of doing red light therapy. Um, uh, this is from, from iMedicine. Um, you can target the mitochondria to produce more ATP and get more energy. Uh, you increase your antioxidants, which is good because those help reduce the inflammation response. You decrease inflammation. Um, you increase NGO genesis, which is healthier blood vessels, uh, more robust blood vessels. And you get to produce BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and other growth factors, which are chemicals that keep your brain young, powerful, and happy. This is some research from uh, 2016, and it's been growing more and more, showing that uh, gamma frequency entrainment, either via neurofeedback or red light therapy, attenuates the plaguing that modifies microglia. And there was a recent paper that I read that shows that high rate variability biofeedback can also achieve this objective. So doing HRV biofeedback, breathing coherent brain biofeedback every day for a few minutes protects your brain from, um, from flaking. It, it reduces your blood brain barrier permeability and makes your brain stronger and healthier. Now, as usual, if you're interested in learning how to do QEG, how to do neurofeedback, how to do biofeedback, then successful practitioner is obviously the way to go. Um, you can book a free 25-minute consultation with Kelly Feely. Kelly will um, ensure that he addresses all your questions and needs. He will point you in the right direction in terms of uh, how you can take the trainings, the equipment you need to buy, but he can also help you set up your practice so it is successful down the road. I will be uh, going to San Antonio in September, and I'm going to be co-teaching with, with Dom uh, some of the classes, and I'm going to be teaching the advanced EEG, and I'm going to be in charge of also doing that mentoring day. So if you're keen, join us for this day's in um, in September, um, we hope to see you there. You can contact Kelly at successful practitionercom um, or via his uh, email, and you can also find him in the different forms of social media. With that, I want to say thank you for your attention. See you soon. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody.